And today uh, we're going to talk about self-driving cars. This is a slide from two, 2016, and although it doesn't show all the small players, uh, we can see there are a lot of companies interested in this area, creating an ecosystem that enables self-driving cars. We can see all the car manufacturers here and all the big tech companies. Um, and if we look uh, back then, uh, this is how it looked uh, 10 years ago in the DARPA challenge that sort of like jump-started uh, the whole thing. And then Google, which uh, now spin off to Waymo, uh, took all the scientists and then moved forward. And then the entire industry uh, came, came uh, to. Um, so this is how it looks today. And we can see all sorts of self-driving cars. Uh, on the right uh, up, we can see uh, General Motors one, and we can see Uber and Waymo and all the other cars. Uh, please note the pointing thing at the top of the car. We'll go back to that later. So we mentioned a lot the term self-driving cars. So what does that actually mean? Do we need a driver? Do we not? Um, so there are a few levels. Uh, there. The first level is level zero. The driver is in full control. He may receive alerts, uh, but that's, that's about that. Um, the next level is more interesting, where the driver has assisting technologies. Here we, talked about, we talk about things like adaptive cruise control and assisted parking. Um, this is where the driver may uh, control some of the things, and some of the, th the operations are autonomous. Uh, for example, uh, steering or, for example, a uh, gas pedal, but not both. Uh, this brings us to the next level, which is level two. And here, uh, the car is able to perform two operations at once. Uh, for example, traffic jam assist, where the car can uh, keep a certain distance from the, uh, from the cars next to it, uh, but also keep the lane. So it controls both steering and, uh, and gas and brakes. Uh, the next level, which is called partially autonomous, uh, conditional autonomous, uh, is where the car can actually drive itself, but the driver may be required to intervene if something wrong happens. So uh, there's a lot of discussion whether this phase is actually possible or not, since it has been shown that when uh, we take the control after the driver, then uh, it can't remain focused all the time. So many companies, uh, including uh, Waymo and Ford, are saying that they're taking the wheel out of the car. They say that they don't uh, rely on the fallback of, an, of a human driver since we can't rely on him to stay focused. Uh, the next phase is level four, which is called high automation. Here, the car is fully autonomous in specific scenarios. This means we don't require any more in any human driver, but this is true only for specific scenarios. For example, highway or for example, urban, but not all cases. And then we reach level five, which basically means everything, our car is perfect, and we can drive without any humans involved. So how does this actually work? What are the elements of self-driving cars? So, uh, let's start uh, with the beginning. Uh, we need a way to sense our environment. And here the sensors come into play. We have a couple type of sensors. Each has its pros and cons. Uh, first, we have cameras, uh, which generate a 2D uh, representation of the environment. Uh, they have the advantage that they can spot things that other uh, sensors can't, like traffic lights or road signs. Um, please sit down. Um, also, we have, uh, remember that I told you to look about the pointy thing uh, on the top of the cars? This is a LiDAR. It's a very accurate sensor, but unfortunately very expensive. Uh, it can cost like an entire car. And then we have the radars, uh, which are less expensive, but also less accurate. And we also have things to help us locate the car, like GPS, which is on its own not enough accurate, but we'll see how to deal with that later. Um, so uh, let's see how the slider looks like. So we have a little video. 
So you can see LiDAR generates a very accurate image. We can understand exactly what we are seeing. We can see the pedestrians. We can see the parking cars. And this helps a lot when trying to identify the objects around you. This is why uh, this sensor is very common when considering self-driving cars. Uh, so now that we have understood the sensors we're talking about, like, let's talk about the challenges. So the first challenge is to synchronize and calibrate all the sensors together. If we want to get an image and understanding of our surrounding, we need to have it at the same time. Uh, we need to consider the effective range, range of each sensor and the, wangle, uh, the, the angle and the elevation. And we require higher resolution because otherwise we won't be able to tell our surrounding. And we need uh, our sensors to be reliable. We don't want any weather conditions to affect them. And we need to check our, our lens uh, condition, uh, which can be affected by dirt, which can be affected by humidity, etc. We want our sensors to operate at all time, uh, even in challenging world conditions. And last but not least, we need to consider our sensor's cost. If a sensor costs like an entire car, then it's not very scalable. So next, we can proceed uh, to know where we are. Uh, if we want to take a turn, for example, we need to know accurately where the car is positioned. And this is why GPS is not enough. Um, this can be done uh, utilizing a map uh, based on LiDAR with lane level annotations, for example. And here we actually use fleets of cars uh, and map the area we want to drive around. And then we can use it as a redundancy for cameras to know where we can and cannot drive. Uh, the trouble is with uh, such an excessive amount of work is that it requires dedicated fleets and a lot of manual work means that it's not very scalable. If we need to map the area uh, we want to drive in before we drive it, then it's kind of a trouble to use it worldwide. And also it has a trouble of handling environmental changes. So we know where we are, what do we see around us? So this is the problem of sensor fusion, of all the sensors that we talked about. We want to be able to classify and detect objects around us and the road conditions. And we want to be able to track our objects and basically generate an occupancy grid. We want to know uh, where we have free space and where we can drive uh, so we don't hit uh, pedestrians, for example. So this uh, problem has many challenges. Uh, the problem of sensor fusion, of course, which is not trivial at all. Uh, we have 2D sensors versus 3D sensors. Like we said, cameras generate 2D images uh, as opposed to LiDAR, which uh, generates 3D, and then we need to handle the projections. Uh, we also need to handle occlusions. If an object disappears from an image, doesn't mean it's not there anymore. And we need to take that into consideration. Uh, we also need to handle extreme visibility conditions, like weather or lightning uh, and stuff like that. We need our solution to be robust and to have redundancies uh, so that if uh, one sensor malfunctions, uh, we still have an image of the, uh, of the world. And last, uh, we require high processing rate because this is, requires online real-time algorithms and we want to make the decision now and not in 10 minutes. So uh, next thing, what to do? Um, this is behavioral planning. Uh, basically, we want to predict the environment in the next couple of seconds so we'll know how to react appropriately. Uh, we need to select our goal. Uh, select our path and how do we plan the motion to get to it. Uh, this is not just static planning uh, because it may require negotiation. If I am, for example, uh, want to merge to uh, the adjacent lane, then I'll signal the drivers uh, around me and I'll hope they'll give, give way to me. And if there are Israeli drivers, they may not be so polite and I have to be more aggressive. Um, so this is the thing that uh, self-driving cars need to take into account. Um, so like I said, uh, one of the greatest challenges is interoperability with human drivers. Uh, for us, when we get into the car, the th first thing we do is curse all the other drivers around us. And so 
obviously it's a challenge for self-driving cars, as in the couple or many, many years uh, from now, we'll still have a scenario of self-driving cars driving alongside human drivers. So if all the cars were uh, autonomous, it would have been easy, but of course, uh, it's not going to be like that. Um, we also have training challenges and complex scenarios, whether it's a highway scenario or urban scenario, which are both completely different, uh, and each contains infinite edge cases that it's hard to predict, and many things that can happen along the way, and we need our self-driving car to be able to handle them. Uh, while doing so, we need to guarantee safety. Uh, we need to be able to trust our car to not make bad decisions that will lead us to dangerous scenarios. And again, like everything on this car, it needs to uh, run on a car. Uh, it needs to be computational uh, feasible, so uh, we'll make real-time decisions. So we have decided what we want to do, so the next thing is how to do it. And here we need our algorithm to issue control commands, like steering, uh, braking, and uh, throttle. And this we need to do in the most efficient way, and plan our motion accordingly. So we've talked about what does a self-driving car, self car means. Uh, how do we train them? How do we make our self-driving car drive itself? So uh, let's talk about the different learning methods. Uh, we have unsupervised learning, which we don't have data, and we're trying to cluster the environment and understand what we're seeing from it. We have supervised learning, uh, where, where we have uh, labeled data, for example, images of pedestrians and images of Con not containing pedestrians, and we want to train a model to understand whether this person is a pedestrian or not, uh, or whether it's a bicycle, or whether it's a car, or anything that can uh, meet our self-driving car on the road. And last but not least, we have reinforcement learning, which is learning from interactions which, with the environment. And basically, reinforcement learning is the most natural uh, learning method in real life. So every time I see a little child testing his limits, I'm all like, hey, he's doing reinforcement learning. Um, so that's actually how we as uh, people learn uh, using interactions with our environments by getting reward, uh, positive or negative, and then uh, we, we make our next decisions according. And of course, we have deep learning, uh, which is a way to describe all these models uh, by using a network with multiple layers and millions of parameters. Actually, the, the significant improvements in deep learning in the last few years have enabled great achievements in the area of self-driving cars. So let's talk about uh, supervised versus reinforcement learning. Um, first, they refer in the data collection. Uh, whereas in supervised learning, we can use offline data collection, we can collect our data, we can label it offline. In reinforcement learning, we need a training environment. Whether it's a simulator or real-time environment, we need to have something we can interact with. We need an environment. And that is obviously more difficult. And we need to have uh, our decisions in reinforcement learning have an effect on the environment, meaning scenarios we uh, saw when making certain decisions won't be there if we made a different decision. And uh, our decisions are sequential, as opposed to supervised learning where is, there is a one-shot decision. And last, uh, supervised learning can be used as an input for reinforcement learning. For example, if I'm using computer vision uh, in a supervised uh, learning manner, I can use that as an input to reinforcement learning and decide uh, which decisions I want to make. So how do we use machine learning for autom autonomous vehicles? Uh, first, we have a lot of usage in the area of uh, computer vision. Uh, we have 2D object recognition and classification. Uh, we want to know what are the objects in the image, 
Uh, we know we want to know where are the relevant objects. Uh, we have three D scene understanding and modeling. We want to understand the pose of the objects while they're looking at, so we can predict what they're going to do next. And we also have semantic segmentation. We want to know the boundaries of the object and gather up the free space, so we'll know where a car can or cannot drive. And with regards to decision making, we have reinforcement learning, that, like we talked about. We want to learn a policy and know how to behave uh, when we see certain things. We're actually getting a state and then determining our, ne our next action. And we also have end-to-end -end learning, which is a, a field where you map raw sensor data into an action. And you don't uh, insert prior knowledge or any model in between. We don't tell our algorithm to first identify objects and then classify them and then make a decision, but give uh, the algorithm the power to decide it end to end like. So we'll see a video which demonstrates this better. So here we can see a walk that all the objects are uh, bounded and we also have uh, the free space here and we also can see the paws of the objects pointing up if they're uh, pointing forward or down if they're looking at us. And this is basically what the self-driving car sees, projected on the camera info. So we can see different, uh, different obstacles. For example, here in purple, we can see the bicycle. And then we can give different physical models for each one. Uh, for example, bicycle and pedestrian behave differently than cars. So to sum up, um, self-driving cars are the new transport transportation revolution. Um, the significant improvements in software and hardware uh, have enabled self-driving cars dream to become a reality, finally, although uh, it has been studied for many, many years, even since uh, the beginning of cars. Uh, it took this long for this to become something people talk about. And it introduces many challenges, both to AI and machine learning community, as well as hardware challenges, both in sensing and in mapping and perception and decision making and control. This is a very challenging and intriguing new field, emerging field, uh, that will have an effect on the life uh, of many, many people and will change the way we view transportation and will enable many things we can't even imagine when this thing become a reality. So, thank you. Uh, any questions? <laughs>